Our first speaker is Alberto Bissin. He works together with Thierry Verde, who could not be here today. Um, uh, Alberto was also uh, with us uh, when we had our presentation at the AAA in San Francisco, the American Association uh, for the American Anthropological Association, and I'm very happy that I was able to convince him to come to Lisbon as well. Um, um, professor Bissin is professor in economics at NYU, and uh, he especially focuses on mathematical economics, which is also a very important part of uh, culture. And uh, he's going to talk today about multidisciplinary perspectives on cultural transmissions. Thank you. So thanks very much for, for the invitation. Um, I, I, I am very happy to try and talk about uh, the stuff that I do and the other economists do in front of uh, uh, non-economists or mostly non-economists. So somehow my title was Multidisciplinary Approaches to Cultural Transmission. Uh, I added the mostly economics because that's what I do and, and so there is, a, there is we, we, are, we are borrowing a lot from uh, other disciplines but uh, we are economists at heart. Um, and it will show um, uh, in, in many things. For instance, I have no pictures. There's all sorts of stuff that will be a little dry, okay, uh, with respect to what you've seen uh, up to now. So, first of all, why do economists care about uh, culture? Um, so, you know, economists have this attitude. Sometimes people who don't like us call it economic imperialism. So, we kind of like want to talk about. We kind of. Like I want to be general social scientist and talk about anything in social sciences, not just economics. We don't, m many of us, most of us, don't, don't deal with finance or money or things or macroeconomics. Um, uh, but, but, but we deal more generally with issues like the, which are typically more associated to political science or sociology. So we care about about this because we are social scientists. Um, we care about culture for for more, if you wish, economic related issues. One is uh, cultural in integration and immigration. Okay, so typically if you think about the debate in the US, the debate about immigration in the US is mostly about their, their stealing our jobs. Uh, but, the, but, the, but the debate instead in, our, in, in Europe about cultural integration is instead they are uh, taking our culture, they are, they are not assimilating such enough where the, the day is a uh, so the issue of cultural integration uh, of immigrants is, is, is a fundamental issue and it affects in fundamental ways cost and benefits both on the immigrant side and on, on the receiving side. Okay, so economists are very interested in, in the dynamics of cultural integration for these reasons. And then more recently, economists have been interested, have, have, have been taking a very long-run approach to growth. Okay, and typically the economics of growth was little simple models about capital and labor and how you combine capital and labor in efficient ways to make the country grow. And then uh, more recently we tried, we, we, we saw that in some sense that's not enough. Okay, so we are trying to understand um, much more how cultural elements or institutional elements, history, geography affects and now we don't call it growth anymore because we want to be bigger, we call it economic prosperity, but it's, you know, it's, it's growth. <laughs> um, and so many of you I, I, I perhaps have heard um, about Darren Asimoglu, Jim Robinson, these are economists who have uh, uh, a very specific idea about what drives economic prosperity. They, they side on the side of institutions and they have all these books now which are, which are all about institutions matter, culture doesn't, which is of course kind of crazy, they both matter, so the question is how much, the question is understanding proportions and stuff. Okay, so this is another of course fundamental issue why uh, we care about culture, okay? Um, so where's the multidisciplinarity come from? Um, so. Typically, we use, so as long as we think about the dynamics of culture, um, we typically uh, take models from biology and anthropology. Um, the, the models are the ones that I think um, anybody else here would, would use if, if he had to deal with these issues, come out with sports of Feldman, Boyle Richardson, this kind of stuff. Uh, so the models are the same. Um, economists add choice. 
Okay, so this is an obsession of economics. This is what the economic imperialism. Okay, so it's the idea that people maximize and choose stuff uh, optimally to do things. Okay, so what um, Thierry and I, in particular, but others have done to this literature is to take the models in biology and add a component of choice, which kind of changes. Um, in, in, in some conditions, changes dramatically the dynamics um, of, of cultural trade, of the population dynamics of cultural trade, which is what we study. Uh, in terms of empirics, uh, we use biological data again. We typically uh, measure cultural differences with uh, genetic distances uh, uh, across populations. Where many of us have done that, not, not me in particular, but many, of, many economists have done that. Uh, we use what's called epidemiological approach. I'm not really sure if it's taken from epidemiology really, or if it's just our own uh, way to try and be multidisciplinary. Again, this is not something that I do, but uh, a lot of economists do this. Uh, we use historical methods and we, we use stuff. All of this, we tend to uh, complement all of this with uh, what we call structural econometrics, okay? So these are statistical methods that are used all over economics, uh, which we think are, are, are useful uh, in this area too, okay? Um, I have 20 minutes, right, Natalie? Okay, so let me see what am I doing. Okay, so uh, let's forget about this whole, no, not let's forget, uh, so let's go ahead from this whole a uh, very general broad introduction. Let's try and think about um, what economists typically have studied uh, uh, with regards to cultural dynamics, okay? So a little bit in the small. So we're kind of interested, we see today, today a lot of pictures about the spread uh, of different cultures, especially the first talk, right? It was very interesting. Um, so I, at some point I also had one of those pictures with all the languages and the little red dots, okay? Uh, I don't have it here, but so that's good. That you've already seen it. Um, okay, so one thing that, that is obviously impressive is the heterogeneity over space of cultures. Um, economists have also, uh, in some sense, one of the things that we do is write down models where it becomes kind of clear that there is a strong relationship between uh, persistence of cultures over time and heterogeneity. Okay, so if you study a single culture, you study the population dynamics of a single culture or a small group of cultures in a relatively um, uh, uh, closely defined geographical or historical environment, uh, one of the issues that you notice, you tend to notice, and you try, and you try to understand uh, modeling-wise, it's the persistence of cultures, okay? So people try to uh, 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 stick with their own culture transmitted to kids, uh, to their own kids, at, at great cost for themselves and for the kids in some cases, okay? Uh, so that's one issue. And, and the whole point is, of course, when you, think, when you, when you, when you write down a model, it's very, it's very clear and very obvious that the two things are related. In some sense, they're the same thing, okay? So uh, strong persistence of cultures gen in the small generates a lot of heterogeneity of cultures which, are, which survive uh, geographically. Okay, so that's one of the things that we're interested in. And again, um, I try to add uh, topics and themes that economists uh, are interested in uh, related to this. Okay, so for instance, the persistence over time is crucial for us um, because, as I said, we're talking about immigration and, and, and growth. Uh, so persistence uh, increases the cost of immigration. Okay, so. Uh, again, the debate in Europe is, is, is at some level, it's becoming, uh, or at, at, it's gone through phases where it was almost racist, okay, um, against immigrants. Okay, so uh, in part, this is, I think, motivated. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not trying to justify this, but this is motivated by the fact that immigrants are actually very actively, um, often very actively trying to keep and maintain their own culture. Uh, this has happened. Uh, 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 in different ways of immigration uh, in different regions in the U.S., uh, Italians in the U.S. were, were known to, uh, uh, for instance, not mix up um, with anybody else. They had intermediate rates, essentially zero for, for decades. Okay, so um, this is happening uh, again, and it's important to try and understand. Um, 
At the same time, persistence over time can induce growth track, can limit growth. So um, I won't, I won't, I won't uh, dwell into this, uh, but it's an important factor. So uh, maladaptive traits can, can get stuck and, and, and generate uh, growth track. Okay. On the other hand, the heterogeneity of cultures over space, of course, has been linked. Uh, so this causation is always tricky, but it's been linked, at least correlation-wise, it's been linked with uh, uh, lack of civic and social capital accumulation, uh, civil wars, and all sorts of stuff. Okay. So I'm not saying that, that heterogeneity is bad at all. I'm saying you know there are issues that are important that economy studies, which are related to this. Okay. Um, all right. So let me just give you an idea of what uh, of what we do. What do I mean by? Uh, so I wanted to give an idea both of the theory and of the models. Um, I have ten minutes. Okay. So uh, theory-wise, what we do is um, one of these models is in particular. Uh, no surprise, I chose the one that, I, that I've been working with with Kiri. Um, uh, this is a model where you know where there's both uh, direct vertical socialization, horizontal socialization. You all know these things. There are these these objects are probabilities of transmitting your own trait. Is the probability that a father uh, there is no sexual reproduction here? There is, there is only a father or a mother. You, you take and a kid. Uh, this is the probability that the father and the kid have the same trait. There is some direct socialization. Uh, if direct socialization are successful, the kid picks a trait. Random from the population. Okay, this generates some uh, population dynamics, which is very nice and can be studied. Um, and then people have studied, and up to this point, it, this is really Cavalli, Sforza, Feldman, and Boyd and Richardson. So, what have economists done? Okay, so let me say one thing. So, one thing that we did, and like uh, a lot of this literature is done, is you think about this vertical transmission as a function of the uh, the cues are the fraction of the population with your own frame. Okay, so you're saying how much? Uh, the, the, so it's a form of social norm. How much uh, a trait gets transmitted vertically depends on how much the trait is prevalent in society. Okay, so there may be many, as we see in the second talk, there are many, many justifications for how or forms that this function can take. What economists have done is they've tried to uh, derive that function from maximization, from the choice of parents of socializing their kids. Okay? So that's the whole idea. You can build up a, a theory, a model of socialization where pa parents optimally try and socialize their kids. And one of the things that comes out from this theory, from this, from this setting up of the problem, um, let me just say, uh, no, let me stay here. Okay? So um, is that there is one fundamental um, character of that function B of Q, which determines where the dynamics goes. Okay? And we call this thing cultural substitution versus cultural complementarity. Cultural substitution essentially means uh, that uh, uh, minorities socialize more uh, than kids relatively, in, in relative terms. Okay? So the whole idea here is minority, minorities, cultural minorities feel threatened for some reason or another. And they know that their kids will not be socialized unless they do. So a parent knows that uh, a parent, uh, an Italian living in the U.S., knows that his kid is not going to be socialized to soccer unless he spends every single night talking to him about soccer, uh, which is what I did with my son. And um, and, and so it, it, this is the sense in which there's a much more, there's a much bigger effort. It doesn't mean that the success is higher, but there's a much bigger effort of minority in terms of socializing. Uh, the kids. So, in the, under these conditions, then you can see, you understand that persistence will come up from the dynamic equation of, in the population. Okay, so this is a force of persistence. When a when a minority when a when a culture when a culture becomes a minority, there is a force which makes it expand. Okay, so if you think about all, all the times in history where we said that the Jews were going to disappear, um, you realize apart apart from the active ways to try and make them disappear, but even if you condition away uh, uh, these things, uh, of course, the Jews in Williamsburg in New York, when they were a strong minority, they started um, uh, coming up again. Okay, so that's the whole idea behind this. And we've, we've shown essentially that under cultural substitution differently, and we can, we can show 
uh, that you know if you take the Holly Sports and Boyle and, 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 and Richardson in many uh, versions of their model, you would have uh, convergence to the extremes, which means population either of one type or of the other, essentially the, the one with um, higher fitness, call it any way you, you want. In our setup, uh, we're going to find situation where both traits, um, this is, you know, what we don't need to trade, where both traits uh, survive. Okay, so again, persistence. Okay, so this is a little model of persistence with only two traits. And the point I want to make is that, you know, you, just, you see this persistence um, if you look at traits one at a time, and you see it transformed into the big heterogeneity of traits that you observe in society. Think of languages or anything you want. Okay, so I don't think you want to see the maximization problem, but again, as I said, this all come up of a maximization problem of the, of, of the father who decides how much to speak about soccer to his son. Okay? Uh, and, and, and of course, who's, uh, the solution of this problem depending on how many other people talk about soccer in that society. In that society or not. Okay? Um, now, it doesn't really, it doesn't always work this way. You can write down uh, interesting conditions uh, under which it doesn't happen, under which really uh, uh, you don't have kosher substitution. You have a sort of kosher complementarity where the small traits just die. Okay? Um, and it's very interesting to study which condition determines what. Okay? So uh, some of this um, was behind the analysis of the uh, point head today, the, 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 the point of the spheres today, but um, it's a little bit different. Okay, so, um, so as far as theory is concerned, that, that's kind of what we are trying to do. Okay? So write down population, dyna population dynamics, with, uh, which are standard, biology, anthropology, uh, taken models, we add choice, we see what happens, what choice does to it, it typically changes the dynamics in fundamental ways, and we try to understand, and by, by doing this, we go back to um, possibly more fundamental reasons why, uh, which can explain which way the dynamics goes, okay, where uh, a trait survives or doesn't survive. To, um, uh, it, 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 to give you an idea, a quick idea of, uh, let me see, how quick an idea? A three minute idea of what we do in the terms of, uh, uh, of uh, empirical work. Um, this is just, this is just, you've seen this a million times. So one, one of the points I want to make is that uh, we often take for granted that genetic variation is a manifestation of cultural variation because the manifestation of, of intermarriage over hundreds of years. Um, I don't know how good is that assumption, but we do that all the time. Okay, so that's one sense um, in which we do uh, multidisciplinary work. Um, this is what I meant by epidemiological approach. Essentially, what we do is we look at the behavior of, uh, let's think about immigrants, we look at the behavior of immigrants um, in the new in the place where they move to, and we, and we try and understand how much this behavior connects to social norms, cultural traits, in the country where they were coming from at the point when they came. Okay, for instance, the typical example here that my colleague Raquel Fernandez and Alessandra Fornia have worked on, uh, one is a colleague, the other is Italian, so that's, you know, very close. Um, so, uh, and Paolo Giuliano also has worked on this, so the idea is, in this case, in particular, is fertility, okay? So uh, think about fertility behavior of women in the US uh, coming from Europe, and look at the fertility behavior in the, in the country of origin, and you'll see uh, a lot, of, an enormous correlation here, okay? So the whole idea is, um, even though uh, Italian women in the US face the same economic condition or social condition um, that American women face, their fertility, or that, that Polish, American uh, women face. There, well, Polish American is not a good example because they're as fat as I say Italian, but German and American um, face, then um, still their fertility behavior is different. Of course, it can depend on many other things. There are a lot of this, there's a lot of discussion of a bunch of other stuff that end on this axis, and we can debate this forever. Forever. But the whole idea is does uh, the culture of origin affect uh, stuff? The other point that I want to make is. There is an enormous amount of work uh, in economics which has to do with history. This is very long-run correlations about cultural traits. Uh, this, this is a list that I've done for the 
for the for the meeting in, in uh, San Francisco, the list here is, is twice as big now. Um, every day there's a new paper. Um, it's really it's really unbelievable. So the whole idea here is uh, um, is connecting uh, um, uh, very long uh, connecting cultural traits at, at two different points uh, very far in the past. Okay, so the ones that I like better. One minute. Yes, the one that I like better is. Um, this Volk Langer and Volk, okay, so which connects uh, pogroms against the Jews in the, in the 1300s, right, right after the Black Death, because uh, in part of Germany the Jews were um, uh, considered culprits of the Black Death, uh, and uh, um, various measures of anti Semitism in the 20s and the 30s, like voting for the Nazi Party and things of this sort, okay? So, big long graph correlation, or trust in, in, in Italian city state, which had uh, which had uh, uh, communes, uh, uh, it, sorry, trust in Italian cities, some of which higher trust in Italian cities, which were city states, as opposed to cities which are not city states, or people beating up each other, senseless in soccer, if there is a history of civil conflict between those countries. Okay, so things of this sort um, uh, are a big deal. Okay, so I don't have much, so the last part that I wanted to talk about. This is the, some of the work that I've done, uh, um, and this is a, a, a bit more structural. So this, what we do here is we write down those models that I showed you at the beginning, models of, of dynamics, uh, explicit models of dynamics of, of traits. In this particular case, we're looking at religious traits in the US, so we really look, we really take down the model, and we really put data into the model. So uh, we estimate parameters of the model, um, uh, Condition on the model being true, of course, that's the trick here. So the assumptions are very explicit, uh, but very strong. Uh, but condition on the model being true, we estimate all the parameters and we try to understand uh, the structure. So in this particular case, we're trying to understand uh, intermarriage uh, between religious, religious shares. Uh, there's uh, Catholics, uh, Catholics, Jews, Protestants, and others. Uh, as you see, Protestant, Catholic, Jews, and others. Um, so we're trying to understand the religious shares. We did it pretty well. And we did some dynamics, of course, keeping parameter fixed. Uh, the dynamics is that Catholics die everywhere. But uh, I don't know you want to buy this. Uh, and we've done similar things on, I'm done, I'm really done. And we've done similar things on integration patterns of mass living in the UK. Okay? So again, write down a model, test the model, test the assumption, and run. Uh, under the parameter, under the estimated parameter, run run interesting uh, uh, implications. In this particular case, is uh, probability of having a strong identity. Strong is we're talking about ethnic identity. Probability of having a strong identity in terms of years spent in the UK. Okay, so and you see it's really very flat um, for first generation, and it's at, and it's a little bit less for the second generation, and it's uh, and it's flatter for Muslims than. Okay, so uh, my, I think I'm concluding here. My whole, I think I have a conclusion slide. So my whole point is, uh, uh, economists work in this area. We are very interested. We're doing all sorts of stuff. Uh, we're learning every day. The experiment today, for instance, was spectacular. I thought uh, the experiment that was shown, and I want to run an experiment um, on these issues. I think uh, that would be very nice. For instance, that's one thing that we've not done. I don't, I don't know of any experiment in economics dealing um, with these models. Thank you very much. Thank you.